Thank you very much for a kind introduction. IMO has made the GHG regulations very stringent. And also recently, they have come up with the EEXI and CII regulation, which could have huge impact on shippers as well as shipbuilders. So I'd like to talk about the IMO GHG issues and regulations and how the liners and the shipbuilders can respond. So IMO's goals are very clear that their vision is to achieve decarbonization within this century. And in order to achieve this vision, they have come up with a target. So for example, like by 2050, they are going to reduce the GHG emission by 70% uh, for each vessel and also the GHG reduction by 50% for the entire shipping industry. So this is very, very challenging. And in order to achieve these goals, they have come up with the short-term, mid-term, and long-term measures. And EEXI and CII are the centerpieces of the short-term measures, and the ETS is the centerpiece of the mid-term measure, and zero carbon and fossil fuel fuels are the, for, are the ones for long-term measures. As you know, the EU has recently adopted the Fit for 55. So aside from the shipping industry, already many other industries, they have pledged to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2050. So IMO regulation, when it was first devised, it was criticized that it's too challenging. But in fact, the other industries have shown more aggressive attitudes and approaches. So this means that the IMO is very likely to uh, strengthen its regulation even further. So EEDI is applicable to new builds, but for the existing ships, in other words, the ships that are constructed before 2013, which represents about 70% of the con vessels, so the existing ships Currently, they have no regulations, um, and so it's not really fair. So for existing ships, IMO has come up with the EEXI to set limits for the operation of existing ships. So this is the requirement for energy efficiency, and all of a sudden, you can see that the ship owners they now have new requirements to dramatically increase energy efficiency for existing ships. So, by, so in other words, the ships that are constructed before 2013, you can see that now they have very stringent requirements that they have to increase the efficiency uh, dramatically. And also for phase two and phase three ships, um, they don't really have to increase efficiency to continue operation. And even if they meet EEX, so if they fail to meet EEXI requirements, then the ships have to be demolished and removed. And even if they fulfill the EEXI requirement, next year they have to again be verified and if they fail for three consecutive years, then the ship owners will receive huge penalty. And the requirements are going to continue to be strengthened. So for example, like fuel oil based ships, if they receive the rating C, and if they do nothing, then later it's going to be um, D. But for LNG ships, it will take some time to be downgraded to uh, D. That's why um, it gives business advantage to the LNG ships. So that's why I think that the IMO has adopted this kind of methodology. And here you can see the timetable. So it was adopted this year. And by 2023, companies are required to to prove that they fulfill all the requirements. And then the system or the new regulation will enter into force. 
And after one round of the overall assessment, they're going to readjust the requirements and maybe further strengthen the requirements. So the current CII regulation, especially in uh, European countries, I believe, uh, will be strengthened further. So in order to meet the requirements of EXI, the most efficient way is to slow down the speed. However, then there are issues with the chartering agreement. Uh, so if need be, then energy retrofit or energy saving devices installation can also be utilized as a way. But then it also induces cost burden. So if it's too costly, then sometimes it may be better to demolish the ship if it's too old and less efficient. So we did the monitoring and assessment of the existing ships. And you can see that the even the new builds that are built with the EEDI, as for the bunkers, you can see that 30% failed to fulfill. So only you can see that 80% of the existing ships failed to fulfill. And so in order to meet their requirements, um, they have to lower down the speed. And if it's within 20%, then it doesn't really have the implications. But if it goes over 30%, then it will start to have huge impact on businesses. In order to improve energy efficiency, various measures can be utilized. One of them is the installation of energy saving devices. And various devices have been developed in um, category A, B, C. So category C is about the recuperation of waste hit. Hyundai Global Service recently announced this data. And you can see that may need the 3% or 4% energy efficiency improvement effect can be achieved. This shows that the, no matter how hard a business's struggle, it's very difficult to improve energy efficiency by more than 10%. So EPL can be a way. And if it's not enough, then EPL with the energy saving device. And again, if option one and two are not available, then LNG DF retrofit can be considered. But it's very, very costly. So we have to think about the academic benefit as well. So if all these three options are not available, then we have to go for option four, which is a new build. And so you have to think about the capex, opex, remaining service life, as well as the time for engineering installation for verification, as well as the cost for the retrofit. That's why we have to devise specific solutions for each ship. So KER has come up with the software uh, in order to assess the impacts from EEXI and CII. And now I would like to talk about how to improve CII. EEXI is a kind of the one-off assessment, but the CII is like lifelong assessment. So you have to continuously receive this verification. And you can see that the CDE, uh, which are subject to fines and penalties, they actually represent 80% of the existing ships. So in order to improve CIA, CII, you have to have systematic maintenance, and you also have to achieve the optimum operation through the speed optimization, trim op optimization, route optimization, as well as the minimization of the har and idling of harbor operation, and also life cycle management based on CII simulation is required. As you know, CII is an operational measure. Here you see that the same ships, A and B, both of them are 1,800 TEU, and their EEDI is almost similar. So in terms of technological performance, it, they are same. But the A received the C rating, whereas the B received A rating. So the differences uh, lies with the distances. So A had a very high speed, and it traveled a very long distance compared with B. So fuel consumption for A is 500 and B 415. But the fuel consumption at birth, A is 75 and B 16, which means that the B shortened the time for harbor operation. 
So if you could shorten the time of harbor operation for A, then actually A can receive the rating, B rating. So this means that the optimization of operation is critical to improve CII. So after the disclosure of CII, I think that it's going to impact the shipyard as well. So in the past, so shipyards produce high quality ships and deliver ships. That was their mission. But with the birth of the CII, now they receive new requirements that they have to provide the uh, lifetime assessment management. In other words, they have to provide various kinds of after sale services in order to have business competitiveness. And again, in the end, the existing ships have to slow down the speed. So I think that this will increase the demand for a new build. So, so far I have talked about the short term and mid term measures. Now let me turn to mid to long term GHG response measures. Although we make a lot of efforts to improve energy efficiency, but in order to achieve 70 to 80 or 100% energy efficiency improvement, we have to uh, change the fuels. So here you see the Clarkson data table. So the light blue indicates the LNG and the other includes the hydro. So currently we have growing orders for fuel oil, but LNG is going to increase significantly and FO will decline and zero carbon fuel will start to be placed with order in the not too distant future. And as for ammonia and hydrogen, they are not economically viable at all right now. If you just compare the fuel tank, you can see that in terms of the storage efficiency, the uh, hydrogen requires three times larger tank than the LNG. And also compared with the FO and LNG, the hydrogen and ammonia, they're very expensive. So they don't really have competitive edge right now. But the IMO market-based data, as well as the EU ETS, which is announced together with the P455 recently, what they talk about is that they're going to provide incentives if they reduce GHG emissions. And if uh, companies fail to reduce GHG emissions, then they are subject to fines. In other words, if they utilize ammonia or hydrogen and succeed in reducing GHG, then they can enjoy various kinds of subsidies and incentives. And also even for the route of operations, um, you can see the various benefits are provided to eco-friendly ships and also the shippers, they no longer prefer the um, polluting ships that produce a lot of GHG. So right now, at this time, um, at this point of time, the G ammonia and hydrogen are not economically viable at all, but through the incentives provided by financial institutions as well as the shippers and cargo owners, uh, I believe that these new fuels can have some attractiveness and continue to strengthen their competitive edge. That's what IMO pursues. And also, LNG um, is also welcome as biofuel. So I believe that the winner really takes everything. So in order to have this alternative fuel that can take everything, we have to develop technology. And regarding that, I'll like talk about KR GHG activity. So here you see the org chart and biofuel, synthetic fuel, carbon capture. We are focusing on technological development for these fields and also ammonia is going to be widely adopted after LNG. So even for the transportation of hydrogen, ammonia is very likely to be utilized. So I believe the ammonia will soon be established as the common marine fuel and infrastructures are going to be placed. Um, so currently we are conducting various researches on ammonia and again hydrogen. So after ammonia, we will rely on liquefied hydrogen. 
So engines and fuel cost supply systems are now actively being developed. Right, hydrogen, or rather ammonia. So ammonia is very likely to be utilized soon. However, when it comes to liquefied hydrogen, technological barrier is still very high. And therefore, for the liquefied hydrogen, we are conducting various research products, whereas the, for ammonia, we are conducting various demonstration projects. But if you could take leadership, so we should not lose leadership in uh, hydrogen, and we should not be the latecomer. That's why we are focusing on R&D for hydrogen. And also electric purging system is also critical, so we are conducting various activities as well. So IMO regulation is revised heavily recently, and it creates a lot of uncertainty, and also it is likely to be further strengthened. And therefore, the shipyards, shipbuilders, and also the ship liners, they really have to pay attention to how IMO regulation is going to be enforced. And we don't really have one size fits all answer in this question. So maybe we can have the combination of the fuel oil and biofuel or LNG plus CCS or green methanol, ethanol, ammonia, fuel cells. So various options are now open and available for us. And we have to. Uh, establish the framework where we can provide the comprehensive management in order before we find out the most cost-effective solution. So when the there is no clear answer, I think this is something that we have to go forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm.